Jai Gurudev, Jai Masters. The spiritual path is both way simpler and way more serious than people try to make it. In order to get your perspective and understand what's going on, it's not hard. You just realize that I'm in here, I live in here. Always come back to that. I live in here. That's not hard to realize. You live inside. And in there with me are thoughts, emotions, and what I receive from my senses. That's your centering point. It's the truth. It's not complicated. It's just the truth. And what you realize is as true as that is and as simple as that is, you can't maintain that consciousness. You can't maintain that state. That for some reason, which you need to understand and figure out, you get pulled out of that perspective. You get involved in the thoughts. You get involved in the emotions. And the outside world stimulates the thoughts and emotions. You drown in them. You get lost in them. You get lost in the thoughts and lost in the emotions. It's not comfortable to be lost. Nobody wants to be lost. Nobody wants to feel that, that sense of drowning, of lostness. And so what we try to do, and it's just natural, what we try to do is stop that, protect ourselves from that, get some sort of solid ground so that we don't have to be lost. Perfectly natural thing to do. If you're drowning, you're going to try to grab anything you can get your hands on to try and feel a little bit more stable. But what we cling to and hold on to are, <laughs> interestingly enough, the very thoughts that are causing us to be lost. The thoughts come, they start talking, Oh my God, what if she doesn't like me? Oh my God, what will I do? Should I call her? No, should I somebody else call her? Oh, she'll figure that out. It'd be so embarrassing. Those are thoughts. They're not you. They're thoughts that you're aware of. Because you're involved in them, you care about them, they're disturbing to you. And really, in truth, they're disturbing. The core thoughts are disturbing. <laughs> they're just disturbing. I, I'm afraid of something. I need something. I want something. I'm, I'm insecure. There's just basic level, base level ego thoughts that are not comfortable. We can discuss later why it's that way, where they come from. But the question is, what do you do about it? If you're not paying attention, what you do about it is actually try to use the thoughts themselves to protect you from the thoughts. It's just the most hilarious thing in the world. So you'll find yourself in there, wonder if she likes me, should I ask her out, I don't know, I don't want to feel rejected, last person I act out, took me a week to get my head straight after she said no, blah, blah, blah. Anyone know anything about that? Okay, so this stuff starts going on. So what we do is we buy into that we need to find a solution to this. And so you come up with something, well, I won't really ask her out, I'll kind of test the waters a little bit, but I won't ask, therefore if it feels like it's not going to happen, I don't have to do it. You try to create another layer of thoughts that will protect you from having to experience the layer that you're having trouble with. And so you build this layer on there that you're going to do this, and then you actually sit out there and you start interacting with people, places, and things based upon these concepts, opinions, views, plots, and plans, etc., that you have figured out with, I'm going to call it the second layer of your mind, the solution layer, but what's the solution about? A solution about the trouble your mind is causing you. But we are caught there. So if the mind is causing disturbance, the only thing we know how to do is to think thoughts that will make us feel better about the disturbance that's created. Try to find a solution. Try to find a way to make it work out. And so then we go out there and do that. What you don't realize is it just creates more and more disturbance because you haven't solved anything. The problem is that you in there are caught in these thoughts in the mind. That's the problem. I've discussed this with you before. It'll take a while before you realize it. But you who is in there, noticing the thoughts and using your will to create other ones that will solve the ones you're having trouble with, that you itself, the core of your being, is very beautiful. It's very beautiful. It has no problems. There's no issues. That If you sat on the core of that being and somebody just completely rejected you and dissed you, you wouldn't have the slightest problem in the whole world. It would just feel like fun. That's your natural state. You don't have to be involved in all this noise that is going on in the personal mind. You who's in there noticing the mind are not the mind. You are the consciousness that is aware of what it's doing. So I always teach you right at that point, 
you determine the direction of your life, there's a fork in the road. Either you continue to invest in finding solutions within the mind to fix the problems of the mind. You understand that? Look, your mind gives you trouble about something her mind didn't give her any trouble at all about. Your mind gave you trouble yesterday about something it likes today. Yes or no? Things in and of themselves are not intrinsically troublesome or not troublesome. It depends on what you have going on inside your mind about them. The mind creates the problem. The thing is not a problem. Even the most terrible things, they're not problems. They're just energy patterns in the outside world. But if they come in and your mind creates disturbance inside, then they are disturbing. If they come in and your mind says, oh, I like this. This is exciting. Oh, my God. Then you don't have a problem with it, do you? It is your mind that's creating the problem about what's happening. It is not what's happening that is creating the problem. So you know, I've given examples, you know this, that different points in your life, you had trouble with different things. Now you look back, you can't imagine why you have trouble with it, which you had trouble with in high school. It looks silly now, or even younger, right? But it'll be the same thing later with your situations now. So you start realizing, I am in there, and here's the fork in the road. Either you continue for your entire life playing the game of if my mind decides to have a problem with something, I am going to use thinking, mind, analysis, hopes and dreams, concepts and views, and develop all these things in my mind to try to create a layer that protects me from the trouble my mind is creating. There are people, not necessarily very healthy, who if you reject them, you tell them, no, I'm not interested, I don't want to be around you. They turn to their friend saying, look at that, she loves me so much, she can't even, she can't even dare to be around me. It's so neat. So they should realize it. Whoa, just make up whatever you want. Make yourself feel better. Come on, you may not be that far gone, but you're pretty far gone. You understand that? He didn't mean that. He didn't mean it. What are you doing? You're making yourself feel better about what you made yourself feel bad about. Because what he said to you didn't bother me at all. I didn't have to do anything about it. But it bothered you. It made your mind get disturbed. Then you developed another layer. You used your will to develop another layer of mind to protect yourself from your own mind. And this is the game that people end up playing. And you can get, not you can get, everyone's very lost. Very lost in there. And then the mind thinks, well, if it's this way, I'll be okay. You don't realize what they're saying is, I'll be okay with the trouble my mind created. Then you go out there and try to make it happen. And that's the next layer of your mind. I always say it's like war. In war, you have strategy, what you're trying to achieve, and you have tactic, how you're trying to achieve it. So you have trouble, you develop a strategy that if she does this and he does this and this happens and it doesn't rain on Wednesday and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and I get a new car and people are impressed with me and I get the job that I want and I get into the school that I want to go to and I become a doctor by the time I'm 23 years old and I have a lot of money. There, go ahead and figure it all out. That's my strategy. Why do you need that strategy? Because those are the things I think will make me feel better about myself. Why do I have to feel better about myself? Because I don't feel good about myself. So you're building a layer. Then the question becomes, how are you going to make that happen? How are you going to make it happen that this person likes you or that you get this, you get the car, you get the money? I have tactics. I told you the ultimate was I had a friend many, many years ago who had trouble with relationships. He didn't have a lot of relationships and he wanted to ever since he was, I knew him since college. And he was older though. He was, you know, in his 30s, 40s, whatever. He had a job in town. He loved living in town. He had a lot of friends. And he said to me, I'm moving. So where are you moving? I'm going to move up to the Boston area. Really? It's cold up there. I thought you liked Florida. Oh, I love Florida. I love Florida. I love the weather. And I hate the cold. But I'm moving up to Boston. I said, why? He said, well, you know, there's a lot of women's colleges up there with very intelligent women. And I'm very intellectual. And so the probability of me meeting somebody that would like me or match me is highly increased in the Boston area. And so I'm going to move up there. He didn't do it, by the way. But that result is, that is the epitome of what I mean by tactic. I'm not okay. I think that having a relationship will make me be okay. This is the type of relationship I think I want to have. So now what do I need to do to make that happen? Sound familiar? All right. And you're literally at war. That's, what, that's strategy and tactics. <laughs> you're at war with the world. Now you go out there and you do everything you can to make it happen. By hook or by crook, you're playing the game. I'm not okay. I don't feel comfortable in here. My mind's bothering me. That's why you don't feel comfortable, because your mind's bothering you. If your mind was not bothering you, you'd be very comfortable in there. 
you woke up in the morning and your mind was saying to you, oh boy, this is fun. I wonder what's going to happen today. I can't wait to see. God, I thought I was going to go get that job, but somebody called up and said, I get a different one. This is going to be fun. What if your mind talked to you like that all the time? Would that be fun? That'd be fun. All right? It'd be a really neat, neat situation. Whatever's happening, you'd be positive. You'd be happy about it. You'd say nice things. If your mind did that, you wouldn't have any problems. But you're having a problem with your mind. Your mind is saying negative things to you. And then basically you try to use the very same mind. It's hilarious. Use the very same mind to figure out what needs to happen so I'll be better about this. Then you figure out how to make it happen. And then you literally go out there and attempt to manipulate and control the world around you so that when it comes in, it matches the strategies that you wanted so you feel better. And if it starts to do that, you do feel better. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If your mind is getting what it wants, how do you feel? When your mind's not getting what it wants, how do you feel? The mind is doing all of it. So one path you can go is to play that game. Literally continue playing with the mind to try to fix the mind. I don't recommend it. The other path is called spirituality, which is what? If the mind is the problem, then the mind is the solution. If my mind is in there causing me trouble about things, it's not the thing I need to change. It's my relationship with my mind that I need to change. And nobody will do that. (laughs) They all think that the answer is figuring out what you want and then getting it. Figuring out what you don't want and making sure it doesn't happen. Everybody's doing that. It doesn't work. It can't possibly work. The mind will just find something else wrong and you'll never be okay. You'll be relatively okay. Relatively, things start going your way. You feel a lot better, don't you? You get hope. You have things. What is hope? I hope someday I'll get what I want. And I think there's a way to do that. What are your dreams? That someday what I want to happen will take place. Someday what my mind has made up that will make me be okay is going to take place. And so it's beyond that. Spirituality is way deeper than that. Spirituality at its core says the following. I am in here and it is not so nice in here. Let's find out why and fix it. It has nothing to do with anything else. It has to do with you and your relationship with your mind. And people say, what about my heart? Have you noticed that your mind and heart are in cahoots with each other? When was the last time your mind said, I don't like this. Oh my God, I don't like this. Your heart went, ooh, I feel so wonderful. (laughs) Not a chance in the world, right? If the mind doesn't like something, the heart reacts accordingly. If the mind thinks it likes something, the heart opens up, doesn't it? So don't worry. The mind and heart are like, Same thing. They're in combination with each other. The energies are playing with each other. So a spiritual being at some point wakes up and says, I'm in here and I have a problem in here. Not a problem out there. I have a problem in here. And if I want to be okay, I can't be blaming on the outside. Nor can I be trying to solve it with the outside. Why? Because the problem's inside. It's like a Band-Aid I'm trying to put over it. And it will always be conditional, conditioned upon what's happening outside. I care about you. I would like you to reach a state where your well-being is unconditional. Unconditional. You're just fine all the time, right? Now, people at that point say, well, what about social work or activism or, or making the world a better place? Can we do that for a second? If you are fine inside, you don't need anything from outside. That's not a cold state. It's a beautiful state. You're filled with love, filled with joy. There's no such thing as insecurity because you're not trying to do anything. You're just filled with energy and light and love and beauty. It's what's inside of you. Guess what? That will make you act. Fear makes you act. Love makes you act. If you love something, you want to interact with it. You want to help it. You want to serve it. And that's how you become a beautiful being. Not by deciding how everybody else should be and trying to make it happen but we're reaching a beautiful state within yourself and then every single thing that comes before you, you're going to want to raise it. You're going to want to help it. It's a natural thing. But if you're not okay and you've decided how everything else needs to be, you're not going to serve the outside. You're going to manipulate and control the outside to try to make yourself be okay. Do you see the difference? You're a taker, not a giver. Of every moment that unfolds in front of you, it has to be the way you decided it needs to be so that you feel better. Versus spiritual being who has learned to tune in inside and gets, is being fed from inside. When the moment unfolds in front of them, they don't need a single thing from it. They don't need to be a certain way. They don't need to not be a certain way. They just understand there's a world out there unfolding and it is the way it is. Now, what can I do? 
how can I bring love? How can I help it? How can I raise the moments in front of me? So it isn't like I'm talking of, it's not passivity. A spiritual being is very active, but they're not active getting what they want. And they're not active avoiding what they don't want. And they're not active at any time laying their trip on top of other people. They're active expressing the beauty and love that they have found within themselves so that they can help others. So awakening means to come back to the seat of self. You're going to call it self-realization. How do you do that? It's easy. I always use the example that there's this ancient yogic technique to stop smoking. This is a lie, by the way. It's an ancient <laughs> yogic technique to stop smoking. All right? And it goes as follows. All right? Somebody says, I'm sorry, I, uh, Guruji, I can't stop smoking. And the guru says, well, I realize you have urges to smoke. When you feel an urge to smoke, do you go find the packs that you hid, that you told your wife and everybody that aren't there anymore? Yeah, okay, we'll chalk that up. First, you've got to find the packs. When you find the pack, it looks complicated to open it up and get one of those cigarettes. They're really packed and they're very tight to get one of those cigarettes out. Do you do that? Yeah, okay. Number two, get the cigarette out of the pack. Then do you manage to take that little cigarette and, and get it not in your eye and not in your nose, not in your ear, but in that hole in your face? All right? Yeah, I do. I manage. Okay, that's the third thing you do. Right? Then do you manage to take fire, hot lit fire, and don't burn your beard or your mustache or anything? Just do it just right, right? Then do you inhale? Yes? Okay. Just don't do one of those things and you'll stop smoking. Do you understand that? All right? Don't tell me you can't stop. You can tell me you can't lift 500 pounds, but you can't tell me you can't not do something you're doing. Why? Because you're the one who's doing it. You may not be able to get her to do what you want, but you're the one who's picking up the cigarette. You're the one who's putting it in your mouth. You're the one who's lighting it. You can't tell me. Don't even tell yourself that you can't not do what you're doing. Just don't do it. That's the same thing with this. That is exactly the core of your liberation, of your freedom. You are right now paying attention to all this garbage that your mind is saying. Start with small things. You have a conversation with somebody. You walk away. Conversation's over. Is it over in your head? Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, my God, I forgot to say. Oh, if I just said, what a minute. So, oh, I can't believe I forgot that. Should I call? No, no, no. Don't bring it back up. He will not be thinking. Okay. Of what benefit is that? All it is is destructive. All it is is creating disharmony and pain and suffering and discomfort within yourself. But you're the one who's doing it. Why would you do that to yourself? It has no benefit and a total cost. So you look at that, and it's just like stopping smoking. You can't, and I'll explain, I can only go so far in, in an hour. Those thoughts are not being created by you. Those thoughts are being created by themselves. You have the right to use your mind and make it think what you want, just so you make sure we agree. Inside, I wanted to say hello right now, over and over again. Do it. Louder. Did it do it? How do you know? How do you know it said hello? Okay. Look me in the eyes and get mad at me and say, because I'm in here and I heard it. There you go, man. Congratulations. I'm telling you, that's spirituality. I'm in here and I heard it. It's an object. I'm the subject. That's all. Well, if it's saying hello, hello, or it's saying, why didn't I say that? Oh, my God, it was so stupid. That's the same thing. It's something you're noticing the mind doing. Okay, so the mind can work two different ways. One is you can willfully create thoughts. You made the thought say hello. You can make it say goodbye. Guess what? <laughs> you can make it say anything you want, can't you? You have control of your thoughts. You have control of your mind. You can willfully, doesn't even take much effort at all. How hard was it to make it say hello? How hard was it to notice saying hello? See, it's effortless. So you have the ability to make your mind think what you want it to think. Very good. No problem. You do that with math analysis and so on you have a computer mind you get to use it however there is an entire group of thoughts like about 95 percent of them easily that you are not doing that you didn't tell your mind to be neurotic about the conversation you just had you didn't sit down there just like you made it say hello all right say i don't know why i didn't say <laughs> you're not making you do that you're just doing it by itself all right the mind is an appliance, just like a vacuum cleaner, a blender, anything. It needs somebody operating it. It has to have a reason for creating thoughts. 
from a willful point of view, you have the right to willfully create thoughts. That's why the mind is creating those thoughts, just like a computer. How would you like it? You sat down on the computer, and you wanted to find out something from Google, and you typed it in, it found it, and it brought it back. You did that. How would you like if you sat down on the computer, and it started spewing out all these answers that you weren't even asking? Or every search you ever did before starts coming back up. That's what we're dealing with. You have the right to use your mind willfully. But it is also true that thoughts are created on their own. But nothing happens on its own in this world. There's always causes. This is spiritual work. Master, you're going to use to call meditation entering the laboratory of soul research. As a scientist, you're in here. You now notice your mind does this. And it wasn't just about your last conversation. Sometimes, this is embarrassing, your mind starts talking about things that happened 10 years ago. Oh my God, that was so embarrassing. Why did I do that? God, I wonder if they still remember I did that. I wonder if Sally knew I did that. I went, yes or no? Wow. Wow, that's kind of weird. Well, why is it talking about stuff that happened 10 years ago? Did you tell it to? No, you're just driving on the street, mind your own business. Start doing it. Okay, can we spend one moment, because that's all it takes, to explain to you why it does that? Because you're not doing that. But you're aware of it, because you're in there. Okay? This is, this is a crash course on why the personal mind does what it does. You have in the past had experiences that were not pleasant to you. Somebody yelled at you. Somebody didn't call when they were supposed to. You got in a car accident. You missed a plane and people got all upset. Things happened, didn't they? And those were little things. Sometimes they're bigger than that, aren't they? Things happen. When they happen, they have a beginning and a middle and an end. Everything does. There's not a single thing in the world that doesn't start, happen, and go. <laughs> you understand that? No atoms have ever stayed in the same place. Nothing, hasn't every single thing in your life came and gone? The Buddhists say things are temporal. It just, it's just true. It just goes by. But it does stay inside of you. You manage to store these things inside of you. That is something you're doing. That's something the world is doing. If you see a snake, it scares you. That's perfectly natural. But then the snake crawls away. But you're still scared. I'm telling you, I reached a point in my life where I said, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. It's not there anymore. Why am I scared of something that's not there? You have to listen to this because that's where it happens. It happens because things come in and they're not comfortable to you. And instead of saying, yeah, there are things that are not comfortable in the world, I just had one. (laughs) Okay? Thank God it's over. And then it's the end of it. But you don't do that. You say, I don't want to feel this. I don't want to feel this. I'm not going to feel this. It's not right. And you resist it. You use your will. The very same will that made your mind say hello, you use to stop it from having that experience. How do you stop having the experience you just had? You can't. The very fact that it's in there bothering you means it happened. You resist it inside, but you can't stop it from having happened outside, can you? But what you do by resisting it inside is you don't allow it to finish. You don't allow it to complete its journey through you so that it can be over. You don't allow it to be over. It's over outside, but it's not over inside, is it? And so you store it inside of you. Okay, we call that resistance, clinging, whatever you want to call it. It's a resistance. When you do that and you store it, where are you storing it? You're storing it inside your mind. You're storing it inside your heart. You're not storing it out here. It already went away out here. The snake's gone. The accident's over. It was over 10 years ago. And still you won't get in a car. Or every time you drive down the road where it took place, you get scared, don't you? It goes, and you think that's normal. It should be gone. In yoga, we call that a samskara, that you stored it with all its energy, you didn't let it pass, you stored it inside. If you handle it properly, it goes through, you can bring it back, like a Google search. Where was that road where I had that accident? Who was that person? I remember that. There's no freaking how, there's no power to it, there's just a memory, all right? You get to bring it back. But when you store it with resistance, it doesn't sit quietly in there. You stored it with power behind it, the power that you didn't want to experience, the power of experience. You resisted with your will. And so now it doesn't sit quietly. That's why it keeps coming back up. If you you put your finger over a teapot that's trying to whistle, guess what? It wants out. 
doesn't it? It's the exact same with these patterns. If you do not let a pattern pass through you and you resist it, even the slightest bit, it stays inside and it keeps trying to release. For how long? Gee, let's see. Psychology says there's this thing called the formative years. What is that, three to five or something like that, two to six? All right. In other words, they're there your whole life. Psychology will argue they're your whole life. You want it in there for your whole life? You had trouble handling it when you were three. What the heck you wanted to be in there when you're 53? Causing trouble. I don't want it in there. So it keeps trying to come back up. That's why your dreams are the way they are. That's what Freud taught you in On Dreams. That you store this stuff down there, then you go to sleep where you're not as much in control. The self drops back a little bit. And the mind is trying to release. The mind is trying to get this stuff out. Just like your body has an immune system that is trying to throw out foreign matters of bacteria and viruses, your mind is way more subtle and intelligent than your physical body. And so it is trying to push these things that you stuck inside of it out. When you're out of the way, it does it in your dreams. I told you, for those of you who study psychology, when you won't let it happen in your dreams, you wake up and you get weird. As Jung taught you, post-Freudian, taught you that it symbolizes. Your mind is so brilliant. It's, look what's going on in here. It symbolizes the dreams, like encrypting it. For those of you into computers, 128-bit encryption. It encrypts it in symbols, and then you don't know what it is. You wake up, oh, there was this hawk flying, and then it dropped the snake into the little baby's nest. And you know, Okay, it means something. The mind was trying to release energy, but it couldn't get it past you, even in your sleep. Well, the same exact, this is what I need you, the deepest thing I teach you. So you all know that happens in your dreams, don't you? You get some pretty wild dreams, don't you? Go to a therapist and tell him, I know, I don't know what my problem is. There's one thing, he says, do you ever dream? Yeah, not a whole lot. I just had, I have this one dream. How often? Every night. Since when? I was 12. You're 63. He probably wants to know about that dream, all right? What is that? That is what I'm telling you about. It is so obvious we're missing it. You stored this energy in there. It is not going to sit in there by itself. It doesn't want to be in there. Your mind has a natural purification system, and it's trying to get this garbage out of it. And therefore, when you sleep, it throws it up. It does the exact same thing when you're awake. That noise that when the mind creates its own thoughts... Why did I say that? I'm saying, what if this What if this happens? Oh my God, I would freak out. It is the exact same process as when you're sleeping. I call them waking dreams. All that noise. It is the attempt to purify the garbage you stored inside is trying to be pushed up by the mind and that's why the mind creates thoughts by itself. The problem is you listen to it. The problem is you have this mind attempting to purify, trying to release the garbage you stored inside, and instead of letting it release it, you push it back down, or you try to manipulate the world based on the fact that this is bothering you. So what spirituality teaches you is exactly like stopping smoking. If you want out, you can't be putting this stuff in your mouth and lighting it. You can't be listening to this. You have to reach a point, I'll tell you how to in a moment, it's not easy, but it's worth it. You have to reach a point inside where you have finally reached a point where you said, okay, I have two choices. I either let these problems dictate my whole life to try and find people, places, and things that are going to make me feel better about the mess I'm making of myself. Or you wake up and you realize this is happening inside of me and it's happening because my entire life I've stored every single thing that ever bothered me inside of me. And they're trying to release. So now there's all this garbage in here and the mind is not a fun place to live in because it's the result of all this stuff coming up. So you decide what I'm going to do with my life, not a weekend retreat, what I'm going to do with my life. Just like the other person, they're going to spend their life trying to find somebody. They spend their life trying to get a relationship. They spend their life trying to get money. They spend their life trying to have a business. They spend their life trying to find what turns them on, right? They'll devote their whole life for that. You devote your life to getting out of here. You devote your life to looking at that mind and saying, okay, I am so sorry that I did this to you. I'm the one who resisted all these experiences throughout my life instead of honoring, respecting, and releasing them. So they stored inside of this poor mind, and now this mind is trying to get them out. You don't look at your mind negatively. You don't get mad at your ego mind. You don't get mad at a single thing your mind says. Even if it's really, sometimes the mind says some pretty weird stuff, doesn't it? doesn't matter. It's not you doing it. It is the stuff you stored in there trying to release itself. And so what you do is you commit yourself to devoting your entire life, every minute of every second for the rest of your life, of saying, 
I was not able to handle it when it happened. I wasn't mature enough yet. I wasn't ready. Didn't understand these things. But if it wants to come back up, I'm going to let it go this time. It doesn't matter whether you let it go the first time or you let it go 10 years later, as long as it goes. But you don't. It bothered you when you were five, and now when you think about it, it still bothers you. Your parents got divorced. It was a very difficult situation. It was 23 years ago. But you can't even think about it. In fact, when you hear about the word divorce, you get all weird. Why are you carrying that inside? You don't have to. The problem is it disturbed you as a five-year-old, so it has all those energies to it, and now when it comes back up, it really is disturbing, isn't it? Even though it's not happening, it's disturbing. You have to reach the point, and this is all of spirituality, where you become comfortable inside, in the self, in your consciousness, of in essence saying, I'm in here, I made a mess in here, but I'm able to let it go. I'm ready, willing, and able to let it go. And so you start this process of what's called purification. That is spiritual purification. Spiritual purification is, I'm going to let go of the impure stuff that's inside of me. What's the impure stuff that's inside of me? The stuff you stored in there that you couldn't handle. So everyone's different. Everyone's path is different because everybody stored different stuff. But it boils down to, are you strong enough, ready, willing, and able to let go when the stuff comes up? Shake your head, no. Shake your head, no. Well, then that's your spiritual path. Your spiritual path is working with yourself. To, to, uh, I, they, they call it core strength, right? You do body work, core strength. This is the inner core. You work on the inner core to make it so that when the stuff comes up, the highest thing to do is to come back to the seat of consciousness, your seat of self, notice that this thing is starting to come up, and commit yourself to relaxing, keeping your hands to yourself, and letting it release whatever energy it needs to. Oh my God, are you kidding? Yes, I'm not kidding. Letting it release whatever energy it needs to, and you keep your hands. You know you have hands in there, don't you? You can push things around. Sit on them. I used to make Mickey sit on his hands inside. No hands. Look, Ma, no hands. Ah! (laughs) It comes up, and you do your best. You will not do perfect. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is that a little bit of it made it through. That you are every minute of every day of your life untethering yourself, freeing yourself by allowing this stuff to continue its journey through the universe, which you were unable to do the first time. Okay? Now, you know you can't do that. But I first, I want you to understand, wouldn't it be nice to not have this stuff in there? And by the way, they can teach you all kinds of techniques to quiet your mind, this is the only one that in the end generates a quiet mind. If there is no reason for the mind to not be quiet, the mind will be quiet by itself, naturally. It is not that your natural state is a neurotic, nervous mind and you need to find some way to tolerate it, cope with it, do your deep enough meditation techniques or something to get above it. It's all wonderful, but I'm telling you, you get this stuff out, the mind's quiet. That means there's no reason for the mind to be talking. You can use your mind. Now Now your mind, can you imagine how much more brilliant you would be if the other junk wasn't going on? What if the only thing going on in your mind was analysis and reason and thought you wanted to do? Wow. You're going to find out you're way more brilliant than you ever, th- no test that they ever gave you measures your IQ. Remember that they had, they had on TV, this is your mind, this is your mind on drugs. Remember that one? Okay. This is your mind. This is your mind on you. (laughs) How can it work well? It's busy being neurotic while you're trying to take your SAT. (laughs) All right? And so if you can get rid of this stuff, you get your mind back. You get your heart back. Your heart's a beautiful thing. Your heart is not all filled with insecurity and fears and, and, and all this kind of junk. It's not. It's filled with love and joy. It's, it's, ever have your heart strengthen you? It just pulls up and gives you the strength? It's always like that. That is its natural state. The natural state of the mind is ready to serve, ready to think, to analyze, brilliant, to receive. It can receive things from higher, higher levels, right, from inspiration. But you can't get inspiration when you're busy being neurotic. The mind's busy. If some great inspiration breakthrough is trying to come through you, it can't receive anything. When you get rid of the junk inside, but it has to be naturally. Ramdas used to say, you can't rip the skin off of a snake. 
It has to shed naturally. Now, first I want to inspire you. This is what you want to do. Notice I said, not on a weekend, with your life, all right? You can either waste your life trying to come up with a tactic that will make you feel better, keep your stuff, and then figure out how to make everybody and everything that unfolds in front of you not bother you and maybe turn you on. Good luck. How's it work so far? It doesn't work. Or you can work on yourself. You can work on letting go of this stuff and get higher and higher and cleaner and cleaner every day on a regular basis. Now, how do you do this? This is the essence of the teachings. You are not going to be able to take on the big stuff that you stored in there that freaks you out. Don't even try. Don't even think about it. I don't want you touching it. That's like, let's say you can lift 100 pounds and you're supposed to be able to lift 200. I do not want you walking to the gym and trying to lift 200 pounds. What you should do is lift 100.1. Probably you can do that. And then 100.2 and 100.3. Build your strength so that you're able to naturally do these things. Otherwise, you hurt yourself. So spirituality is not about force and fighting. It's about understanding that right now, my core, my inner being is weak. It's unable to look at these things that are coming up and let them go, to let it pass. It keeps pushing them away. It keeps protecting itself, doesn't it? So what you do is you start building your strength. And I've taught you time and time again, but it's worth it. You do it with small things. You don't even start with the stuff that's coming up. You start with the little things in life that are bothering you. The weather, how somebody's driving in front of you, the fact that somebody didn't say hello, the fact that you dropped some ketchup on your pants when you went to lunch, the fact that you went to a party and someone's wearing the same dress as you and, oh my God, you thought yours was special. Come on, these are really difficult things to handle, aren't they? But they do bother you, don't they? Good. That's where a yogi works. Good. I'm glad they bother her because I want to get rid of being bothered. And these are easy things to deal with. So you work with yourself. You work with yourself. You raise yourself. You can do it through affirmation. She's in there complaining that the person's got the dress on. And all of a sudden, you catch it, you see it, and you sit there and say, God, I love how that dress looks on that lady. Wow, I'm so glad I picked this one, because it looks. I wonder if it looks as good on me as it does on her. That's a good-looking dress. You start making your mind say something constructive. You make your mind say something positive. Right away, it's nicer. It doesn't mean that the underneath thing... Now, remember, I told you, you can make your mind say what you want, because you have will, and it can control the mind. But the mind has this stuff underneath. Remember, we talked about that, all the stuff you stored across your entire life? It is not going to go away So don't come to me and say, well, I tried to use affirmation, but the negative stuff won. It kept going on. I was lying to myself. No, you say the positive things as a neutralization, as an alternative to the stuff that the mind is trying to say by itself. Do not use affirmation like a sledgehammer. I love it, I love it, I love it. You're suppressing. Don't suppress. Just leave it alone and use your attention and your will to use affirmation, to use positive thinking. There are lots of people that teach those things. So you work with that. But if it feels yicky inside, if it feels like I'm lying to myself, just don't pay attention to that. That's your garbage talking. I told you why the mind says what it says. It's not going to stop until we purify. But you don't have to participate in it. So you do something else. So that's one thing you can do. I've been teaching this so much lately. I used to never teach techniques, all right? But I used to do very general. The other is what we call mantra. That doesn't sound like mantra, but I'm telling you, this is the core of mantra. You train your mind to say something over and over again. Say so there are Sanskrit mantras, right? Om Namah Shivaya, Hum Brahmasmi, that's my favorite. And if you're not into Sanskrit stuff, which is perfectly fine and understandable, I didn't, I didn't use that. When I was doing a period of mantra, I just did God, 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 God. (laughs) It worked just fine. The point is, you get something going on inside your head. Let's say you started saying inside your mind, I can handle this, I can handle this, I can handle this. And then all of a sudden, somebody starts driving slower than you like, or starts raining, and, and, and so this is the point. Your mind starts going, why is that the rain on my birthday? This is ridiculous. Why, what did I do wrong? All right, in the meantime, in the background, because you trained it to, you did a couple of times a day, 15 minutes, you practice with saying this, when you're driving your car, when you're taking a shower, lots of time, it doesn't take any time. I can handle this, I can handle this. Then all of a sudden, it starts doing the noise, and behind there, it says, I can handle this. It's like another layer of your mind. Now, that is not the same as positive thinking. It's neat. I like you to understand the difference. Now what you do is you have a choice of where you want to put your consciousness. 
It's not an act of will to make the mind say something else. It's a shifting of your attention. Do I want to put my consciousness on the garbage that's pulling it into there? Or do I want to shift my consciousness to what the mantra is saying? I can handle this. I can handle this. God, God, God. You see what I'm saying? You see the difference? You, you leave the mind alone. What difference does it make what the mind is doing if you're not paying attention? You go into a room, there's a whole bunch of people. You don't pay attention to all of them, do you? Right? You only pay attention to the one you're talking to. That's what I'm asking you to do. Shift your focus to the mantra. And the next thing you know, you have left room for the purification to take place. If that noise is going on and you shift your consciousness to the mantra, you have left room for that to release. You didn't suppress it. You didn't touch it. You didn't get involved in it. You didn't participate in it. If you leave it alone and put your attention elsewhere, you are actually allowing the release of the energies that need it to release. And you're going to find out that they get less and less. That's the power of mantra. That's why some of these techniques, look, positive thinking, it's a big technique, isn't it? All right? Affirmation, positive thinking. Mantra, as a big technique, was taught from the beginning, thousands of years ago in yoga, right? Then the third that I taught you, which is the highest, but you have to work your way up to it. Don't come back to me and say, I don't understand, I can't do it. When the noise starts, you're centered enough, meditation will do this for you, you're centered enough to where you see, this is what Mickey was talking about. This is my stuff releasing. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. I don't want that stuff inside. You're not saying this. You're just how you look at it. And you realize, I don't want to mess with it, so you relax. The highest technique there is is relaxation. You just relax. When you're relaxed, you can't engage. Neither to push it or hold it or do anything about it. You just relax. You are relaxing back into the seat of self. So you relax and you lean away from where it's coming from. You'll notice that the noise and the disturbance is actually coming from somewhere inside. You are behind that, noticing it. Relax and release. It's a very high technique. I call it R&R. You need some R&R, all right? You just relax and release. And if you can do that, and it takes some time to learn to do it, as you, but you'll build the strength. If you're able to handle this much disturbance of it raining when you don't want, the car driving, somebody beeps at you, the whole thing, nothing. You build that strength inside that I can handle this. I can handle that level of disturbance. Then you can handle it with everything at that level. Then the next thing comes up. You do it with that. Next thing, it's a very gradual process. They, you, I know you've heard, you will never be presented with something that you're not capable of handling. So you just keep letting go, letting go, relaxing, and all of a sudden you get strong. Not this kind of strength. The Zen kind of strength. That's the strength of a blade of grass bending in the wind. Not the oak tree. You have the strength of being able to let go. You're not stronger than it. You're not engaging in it. Here, the ultimate example I used to use, you're having a tug-of-war. You want to go have lunch, but you're having a tug-of-war with the entire Gator football team on the other end and just you. And people taught you all kinds of techniques, how to dig your heels in, how to build muscles. This is hard. I just want to have lunch. How are you going to pull that whole team over here? And Yoda shows up. I like Yoda, all right? Yoda shows up. He says, Luke, <laughs> relax. I'm going to relax. They'll pull me. He'll go flying through the mud. Luke, relax your hands. You didn't even realize your hands around the, the rope. What would happen if you relax your hands? You go home and have lunch. Nobody said you have to beat that football team. Nobody said you have to play the game. You're a free being. I don't have to hold on to that rope. You do not have to beat your lower self. You do not have to get rid of your lower self. If you stop engaging, you have immediately left room for it to come up. Get it straight. You're the one who stopped it from coming up. If you let go, just like letting go of that rope, but you, you're used to holding on, aren't you? Right? If you let go, there's nothing for you to do. That's the state of non-doership. That's the state of transcendence. You just relax enough, and it goes. And then enough one goes, and then some big stuff goes, and then some really big stuff comes up that you don't even know where it came from. And then it goes, and you just, every day of your life, you're a different person. And then eventually what happens, because as you let go, you're leaning away from the noise. Just lean away. When you lean away from something, you're leaning into something. So you're actually leaning into the seat of self. And at some point, I guarantee you, if you will do this, at some point, you will start to feel this love, this joy, this shakti. 
you will start to feel this rush of love and beauty. Where is it coming from? It's coming from way back inside. And eventually you'll find out it's coming from you. You in there. Hi. You have a nature. And your nature is in yoga. We call it Satchitananda. Eternal conscious ecstasy. You will come to know that. You're aware. You're there. Were you in there when you were 10? Were you in there? You know that. When you were 12, did you look in a mirror and see a body? Did it look like this one? No. But was it you who looked? <laughs> right? You're eternal. You have no age. You have no gender. You're just consciousness. So Satchitananda, eternal, conscious, ecstasy. That is the nature of self, is the nature of the divine being. It's the nature of yourself. So as you let go of the lower self, you fall back into the higher. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to try. No, just relax. Relax and let go of what's keeping you bound, and you will go up. And then it becomes ultimately beautiful until every moment of your life is a beautiful experience. And then guess what? Every moment of every life around you is a beautiful experience because you're a beautiful being. And so as you fall back and let go of this garbage that you're tying yourself to, you will come into the higher part of your being. It will be a natural state. Then, then like I said, it doesn't mean you're passive, but you're not active to get it the way you want. You're active to see what you can do to help raise it from where it is. You're raising it every moment. A high being is not manipulating or controlling or yelling or screaming. They're just raising the energy at whatever level it is. They're sitting there raising it. So I told you to start with the spiritual path. is very simple. It's pretty simple. You have to read 8,000 books. You don't have to learn Sanskrit backwards and forwards. It means, are you willing to let go of yourself? All right? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing? Not big. Don't get scared. Are you willing to, if you walk out here and your shoes aren't where you thought they were, your mind starts, what kind of place is that? I thought it was a spiritual place. Someone stole my shoes. Oh, there they are. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the moments I want. I don't need these big flights. And I want you to be conscious enough to where you notice how neurotic it is in there, how crazy it is. And then you just let go. What do you do if something like that happens? You look down at it when it made all that noise and say, see, chuck one up to me. It just gives you inspiration. How often has your mind been wrong? How often has your mind been wrong in there when it says why somebody said something or what they're going to do and they won't show up? It doesn't know what it's talking about. All right? It only knows the experience it's had. Right? It's totally tainted, isn't it? So you look at it each moment and you don't yell at it. You are the one who broke your mind. Don't you dare blame your mind. Your mind's brilliant and beautiful. You store all this garbage in there. Work with yourself. Just every moment of every second, the energy that you're now putting out to try and make things be the way you want and make them not be the way you don't want, I'm telling you, it's, it's a waste. You're not going to get anywhere that way. It's a losing battle. Come in here, inside, while you're moving around in the world, and let go of yourself. Use every single second of every single minute of your life to go to God. And it's going to work. All right. Work on these things. Jaggered.